Okay, uh, welcome everyone uh, to the second lecture of this school. And, um, you know, like I'm happy to extend a warm welcome to uh, Tom Hartman, um, you know, though it's a virtual welcome. And uh, Tom Hartman is an associate professor at Cornell University and, um, and he has worked on um, uh, many different kind of um, problems in quantum gravity, in quantum field theory, uh, and, and in quantum information and so on. And uh, uh, we are very happy that he has accepted our, uh, our invitation uh, to give us uh, lectures on you know, like holography, entanglement, and, and quantum field theory, conformal field theory, and so on. Uh, so yeah, so over to you, uh, Tom. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, so welcome everyone. Um, before I get started, um, I just want to say that I, I hope to get to chat with some of you in the in the Slack and in the questions. Um, you know, when we do these in person, that's one of the that's one of the great things about these schools. And I hope we can I hope we can try to reproduce that in the Slack. I obviously won't be in there while I'm giving the lectures, but I'll be in there uh later in the day so you can post questions and and we can discuss um during the lectures um if you have questions about clarification like what does that symbol mean then please just jump in um just just speak out uh you don't need to use the raise hand we'll see how that works uh if if there's too many people and we need to adjust we can do so uh if you have uh, longer questions then um what i'm going to try to do is is pause occasionally to to ask those if they're pressing, I think I think uh, I think you can go ahead and ask um, if I have it. If I don't if I don't pause soon enough, um, just go ahead and and ask your question, and um, we'll see how it goes. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to be discussing in these three lectures is entanglement in quantum field theory and quantum gravity, and uh, this is a big subject. So I've I've uh, picked a, a path through it, and uh, the the path that I'm going to take is one that emphasizes the path integral approach, the Euclidean path integral approach to quantum field theory, and uh, to quantum gravity. Um, sorry, there's I, I'm not going to be watching the chat. I can see that people. Okay, I'm going to just ignore the chat. I think some people can hear me, so. Um, I'll get too distracted if I watch it. Okay. Yeah, um, if, it, if there's something I will, I'll let you know. You okay, great, great. Um, okay, so uh, I'm gonna be focusing on path integral methods. In the first lecture, uh, I'm gonna review some basic, I'm gonna review the basic approach to Euclidean path integrals in quantum field theory. Uh, so by quantum field theory, I mean quantum fields that are uh, possibly in curved space-time, but not coupled to gravity. So this will be quantum field theory in a fixed curved space-time. Uh, in the second lecture, uh, and I'm going to emphasize replica methods in particular, um, because what I want to do um, ultimately is to, uh, is to describe how we use replicas and path integrals in quantum field theory and then to describe how we do it in quantum gravity and uh, to emphasize the differences between these um, and introduce both of these sets of tools. And we're, we're going to work through uh, some, some specific, some concrete calculations in both cases. Uh, in the second lecture, um, I'll discuss generalized entropy, black hole entropy, and the holographic entanglement entropy formula of Rutakanagi and extensions. And then in the third lecture, uh, I'll discuss replica wormholes uh, and the entropy of Hawking radiation. Okay, so let's get started with lecture one, uh, path integrals entanglement in quantum field theory. And uh, at this point, um, space may be curved. I'll talk about quantum field theory on various manifolds, but um, the metric is fixed. Okay. So first, I want to discuss some basics of Euclidean path integrals to set the stage and get us all on the same page here. Um, 
and this is in QFT. So uh, the purpose of the Euclidean path integral is to calculate a transition amplitude. And I'll think about it this way. Uh, so quantum states are labeled by some field data on a spatial slice. So phi of x labels field data as a function of space. And uh, what a Euclidean path integral does is it calculates a Euclidean transition amplitude uh, by the action of the Hamiltonian. Um, so the Euclidean path integral is a path integral over fields weighted by the Euclidean action uh, with boundary conditions uh, phi one and phi two um, at time. Well, the, the first boundary condition uh, is imposed say at Euclidean time zero and the second one at Euclidean time tau. Now I don't wanna keep writing these path integrals. So I'm gonna use a shorthand uh, for this path integral. Uh, which is the following picture. So the picture uh, is a strip of length tau, and uh, we put a boundary condition phi one of x on the bottom, phi two of x on the top. And uh, so what that picture means is that picture means the path integral above. Uh, it represents doing the path integral on this on the manifold that's drawn, which is the Euclidean manifold, uh, with the boundary conditions phi one and phi two. Uh, a cut path integral uh, formally defines a quantum state. So what I mean by a cut path integral um, is, uh, for example, the state psi defined as e to the minus tau h phi one, uh, which is the path integral that's similar to what we had before. We put boundary condition phi one at the bottom. Then we evolve by a Euclidean time tau Tau, uh, but at the top, uh, I put a cut, which I represent by this squiggly line. And at that cut, the, the boundary condition is unspecified. Okay, so um, what is a quantum state? A quantum state is a linear operator uh, that takes uh, other quantum states and uh, turns them into complex numbers. So in this case, the way you should think of this is that uh, a, a quantum state is a formal object with an unfilled, uh, an un with a that that accepts that accepts some field data on the left, um, and this path integral is a formal object that accepts some boundary conditions, and turns those boundary conditions into a number. So this cut path integral uh, is a quantum state, and it defines for us a wave functional. Uh, by the usual, um, by the usual definition of the wave function in quantum mechanics, uh, the wave function in this state is a functional of field data phi two uh, calculated by the overlap of phi two with psi, and that overlap is just the uh, transition amplitude that we um, calculate by putting phi one at the bottom and phi two at the top. As a second example, um, we can use the Euclidean path integral to calculate the vacuum state that I'll represent by zero. So uh, the Euclidean path integral that calculates, that, that prepares the vacuum state is the path integral uh, where instead of doing this on a strip, we do it on a half space. Okay, so now uh, the I'm I'm drawing this uh, in a similar way, but now the uh, 
now the, the line at the bottom is infinitely far away. Um, and we don't have to impose any field data there. We just impose regularity of the fields down at minus infinity. And that's enough uh, to specify the state um, simply because in the operator formalism, this is e to the minus infinity times h acting on anything. And uh, if you evolve with the Hamiltonian long enough uh, with this damping factor, that will um, kill all the states that are not the lowest energy state. So this will project you onto the vacuum state. It's not normalized, um, but um, yeah, so the, the path integral calculates unnormalized uh, unnormalized quantum states, and we'll have to account for those normalization factors separately. Okay, so um, this is the path integral representation of the vacuum state. Um, and any uh, path integral with a single cut defines for you a quantum state in this way. Uh, because any path integral with a single cut is a linear operator uh, and that gives you a complex number if you supply it with boundary conditions at the cut. A path integral with two cuts uh, defines an operator. Operators have two legs, uh, two slots to fill in, um, one for each cut. So, for example, um, hello, uh, Tom. So there, there's yes. a question on how do we normalize and when is this normalization important? Uh, if it is a short enough thing to answer. Yeah, the the um, well, it's. It's important, for example, if we want to calculate a, a correlation function, those are normalized expectation values. It'll be important when we calculate the, uh, the entanglement entropy later in this lecture. How do we do it? Well, we just divide by the, we just divide by, uh, we just divide by the, uh, the norm. Okay, so, um, an example of an operator defined by a path integral is the thermal state rho beta, which is the operator e to the minus beta h. The path integral uh, that calculates this operator formally is um, a path integral with two cuts. It's a strip of size beta in the vertical direction uh, with a cut at the bottom and top. Okay, so uh, this is a uh, this represents a path integral where both boundary conditions are unspecified. At the bottom, it's unspecified. At the top, it's unspecified. Um, in other words, um, what, whenever you see these pictures, you should think of them as a prescription for calculating matrix elements. So the matrix elements phi two, rho phi uh, rho beta, phi one are calculated by supplying some field data and doing the path integral on the picture that's drawn with this field data on the cuts. Again, an operator is, a, is, is formally defined as something that takes two pieces of field data and gives you a number. Similarly, an integral with unspecified boundary conditions takes two pieces of field data and gives you a number. Then from this, we can calculate the thermal partition function Z of beta as the trace of rho beta um, which is the sum over, um, if we work in the field basis, it's the sum over phi one, sum over fields phi one of X, um, where since we're calculating a trace, we now put the same field data on the top and bottom of this picture. So it's this operator rho, which is a strip of size beta with a phi one at the bottom and a phi one at the top. Uh, but if you, what the trace does uh, is it glues this picture together, okay? Because summing over, do, doing the path integral on a strip with periodic boundary conditions, which is what this is, uh, is the same as just doing the path integral on a periodically identified 
space time. So uh, we can instead think of this as a path integral on the cylinder where the cylinder uh, has size beta. So we've reproduced the well-known fact that the thermal partition function is calculated by um, doing the path integral on a cylinder, uh, which is periodic in imaginary time. So the cylinder, uh, well, I'm drawing these, of course, as if we're doing two-dimensional quantum field theory, but everything I've said here is general. And the cylinder for the thermal path integral is, is the space, whatever that may be, it could be curved, it could be, it could be some, some crazy manifold uh, times a circle uh, of size beta in the Euclidean time direction. Um, hello? Uh, yes. So, uh, Tom, a question about the previous thing. So uh, the question is, in the equation with e to the power minus infinity acting on anything will give zero. Uh, isn't the state zero formally zero? Um, well, once we normalize, it won't give zero. So, so um, what we're really doing is we're keeping the leading term, just like in the I epsilon prescription uh, in quantum field theory, what we're doing is we're, we're keeping the leading term. And then when we normalize, that gives us the vacuum state. Um, and actually I was, this is a place I was gonna pause to take questions. Um, because I'm now going to um, switch gears a little bit. So let me pause here and see if there are questions about these pictures and the use of the Euclidean path integral to prepare quantum states. Before I take questions, let me, let me reiterate the, the, the slogan, that the way I like to think about it, is that Lorentzian path integrals evolve in time. Okay, so in a, in a Lorentzian path integral, you have a quantum state and the path integral evolves in time under e to the i h e to the minus i h t, in the Euclidean path integral, I think of the Euclidean path integral as preparing a quantum state, uh, and I've described some quantum states here that you can prepare with the Euclidean path integral. Uh, maybe the most common one being this Euclidean preparation of the vacuum state. Okay, so let me pause here and see if the, see if there are questions. So, so there is one question, which is uh, how would the norm of a state be written in this manifold way? Um, well, all of these represent path integral calculations. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just drawing pictures, but every one of these pictures is a calculation. And the norm would be, this would be the calculation uh, of the overlap. So when we calculate an overlap, what we have to do is we have to draw two of these pictures and uh, sum over the, the um, let me let me write the calculation. So zero zero is the sum over phi uh, one of x of um, this thing, which represents zero phi one, and uh, this thing. which represents phi one zero. So I've just inserted here a complete set of states uh, to do this calculation, um, but that's simply the path integral on, uh, on the full space. Okay, so this, if we're doing, if, if we're doing Minkowski's, if we're doing a, a flat space here, then this is just the path integral on RD. So formally, the norm is the path integral on RD. Of course, to, to really get a number, you have to regulate these things. Um, um, you have to regulate these things more carefully. Uh, but we'll see an example of that when we come to the density matrix in the, in the entanglement calculation. OK, uh, next question is, um, what does the sum over phi 1 mean? Uh, do you sum over all possible phi? Yeah, that's the path integral. Uh, by sum over phi one, I really mean a path integral um, over the field data on a spatial slice. Okay, the field data, uh, these all uh, the quantum states correspond to field data not in space time but in space. Okay, so that's the sum over. That's you could think of that as inserting a complete set of states, or you can think of it as doing a path integral that's restricted to that one space, that one time slice. Okay, uh, the next question is, could you explain more this picture for the density matrix row? 
Um, let's see. Um, so what this picture means is uh, really shorthand. This is a this is a formal way of telling you that the matrix elements of rho are calculated by the formula that we discussed up here. Okay, so let me find it, this formula, okay. So this formula was the defining property or the essential property of a Euclidean path integral is that the Euclidean path integrals calculate transi transition amplitudes uh, with an imaginary time evolution. That comes, uh, that, that's just the, the basic property of the path integral formalism. Okay, so in fact, this equation here is equivalent to the equation uh, that rho sub beta is equal um, to the path integral on a strip of size beta. One, in one equation, I've stripped off the boundary conditions to define an operator. Uh, in the other equation, I've, I've supplied the boundary conditions and then get a number. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I, I suppose uh, so, yes. Um, so the next question is, um, uh, could you maybe explain what you meant by imposing regularity at infinite time in the past while calculating the ground state? Um, I simply mean that the fields don't, the, the fields there can't be, can't be infinite. They have to, we only sum over fields which um, die off at infinity or don't blow up at infinity. The, the exact details of what's meant by regular will depend on the details of what kind of field they were studying in what space time, uh, et cetera. We'll have to find some consistent boundary conditions to impose. Uh, but um, basically we just don't want it to be infinite because if you uh, put something infinite there, then uh, this evolution won't necessarily project you onto the lowest energy state. As long as we put some finite linear, linear combination of, uh, of states there, this will always project us onto the vacuum state. As, as long as we, well, we have to be a bit careful that the state we, we put there needs to include the vacuum um, so that we can project onto it. Uh, but that'll typically happen automatically. Um, sometimes there's some additional data, say in the boundary conditions of fermions that picks out some sector. And then we're talking about the boundary, then we're talking about the vacuum state in that sector, the lowest energy state in that sector. Okay, uh, so the next question is, is it possible to define all the operators of the quantum field theory through this prescription? Uh, well, no, I wouldn't think of this as a general way to define operators. Um, well, the, the answer is yes, although I, I, haven't, I haven't given you a, a general enough way to do it. So if you want to prepare general quantum states, let's first talk about states as opposed to operators. If you want it to, to be able to find general quantum states, um, then uh, you need to allow yourself um, not, well, you need to allow yourself to insert some um, additional operators into this path integral. So you insert an operator here, uh, insert an operator here, uh, and those, those will give you an excited state. Without these operators, this, this path integral would prepare the vacuum state. With those operators inserted, which, uh, which, so what this picture means is that when we do the path integral, um, we, we include those additional operators in the path integral. Uh, with these operators inserted, you can now uh, define an excited state. And uh, it's essentially a theorem in Minkowski space um, that by doing this, you can, um, construct a, a dense uh, set of states in the Hilbert space of the, of the, of the real-time theory. Not every state, but you can, you can construct a dense set of states. Um, I imagine that the situation with operators is similar, that you can construct 
um, most operators this way, and you can probably arbitrarily well approximate any operator, but I don't know of a, uh, of a um, rigorous statement. So the next question is, how do we prepare the vacuum for a quantum field theory defined on a compact space-time like a sphere? Good. Um, well, I don't think this is really a well-defined question. So the, 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 the states of a quantum field theory or the Hilbert space of a quantum field theory uh, is something that refers only to space, not to space time. Okay. You, you can't ask what is the vacuum state of a CFT in D dimensions on SD. That, that's not, those words don't really make sense. You can ask what is the, you can calculate the path integral of a CFTD on SD. Um, but when you talk about the set of states, you're talking about uh, quantum states defined on a, on a time slice, okay? So you can talk about uh, the Hilbert space of a CFTD on the space SD minus one, um, and then the ground state of that will be calculated. Um, so this will have a ground state, which is calculated um, by the pictures I've drawn, except now space, uh, space is a, is a circle. Um, and we go to, inf we take the circle and uh, multiply it by the half line. So this is, a, this is the, the, the half space and we put the cut here and that defines the, uh, that defines the vacuum state on SD minus one. Um, so could we define the Hamiltonian operator using this description? Uh, I think formally, well, I think you'd have to take some derivatives of these pictures. I, I, I don't think this is a useful way to think about defining the Hamiltonian. If you take some derivatives, you could probably, you could probably write a formal expression. Um, but, um, well, let me, let me back up a second because of the, the questions that people are asking. So there are some states that are useful to talk about in this formalism. Um, because there are certain states which have a nice Euclidean path integral preparation. Okay, the vacuum state is an example. Uh, the state that you get by, uh, well, the, the vacuum state is an example. The thermal state is an example. Um, there are other nice examples. We'll discuss a couple of them later in this lecture, uh, but it's not useful, it's not necessarily useful in every quantum state. There are some states that have nice Euclidean path integrals and, and others where it's just not a very useful way to think about it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna try to take the physics that we're interested in and, and phrase it in terms of states that have nice Euclidean path integrals when we do our calculations. So I don't see uh, any other question. Okay, oh, sorry, one more question. The picture of two cut is that the initial uh, initial state and final states are same. Uh, um, if the question is about this picture, then the answer is no. Um, the cuts are unspecified, and when you specify them, you can choose to put the same field on the two sides or not. You can put put a phi two and a phi one. It's an operator, and it takes two different inputs. To, to, to produce a number. And uh, I think Mrityanjay uh, Nath has raised the hand. So, so do you want to ask a question? Yes, sir, Mrityanjay. Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay, so when you are taking the, uh, uh, writing the, partition function as the trace over rho b. So you are writing this uh, uh, boundary condition phi phi and then there is a sum. So now since the boundary condition is same uh, for the 
for the case. So I, if I identify I phi one phi one both the ends, then I get the cylinder. Now since there is a, a sum over phi, am I summing over different cylinders, or is it that there are in between phi two, phi three, phi three, uh, and then the last one is phi one? That's how I'm getting only one cylinder. It's just one cylinder. The sum over phi imposes periodic boundary conditions on the strip. Um, it, that's the if so. Um, what I recommend everyone do after this lecture, I don't have time to write everything as a as a path integral. What I re recommend everyone do after this lecture is to take these pictures and write them as integrals. Okay, and when you write down the integral here, what you're going to do is you're going to specify the same boundary condition at the two ends. That's the same as a periodic boundary condition. So the point is that this the integral that you'll get that you'll write down here is the same as the integral that you'll write down here. They're just the same, the same integral. Okay, maybe I should keep going. Um, and we can continue discussing on the Slack afterward. So um, I now want to introduce some basics of the notion of quantum entropy. So quantum entropy or von Neumann entropy uh, is defined S of rho is minus trace of rho log rho. And um, there's many different ways of interpreting the von Neumann entropy. Um, I think one that I like and one to keep in mind uh, is that it's the number of states, or the log of the number of states rather, required to purify the density matrix rho. So given a density matrix rho uh, in a mixed state, we can always purify it by joining in an auxiliary system. And um, in order to do that, your, your auxiliary system has to have a Hilbert space of dimension at least e to the s. For a bipartite system, which is a system whose Hilbert space factors into two parts, HA and HB, uh, we can define a reduced density matrix. Well, if say we have a, a state on the full space, we can define a reduced density matrix rho A, which is the trace over B of rho AB. Um, and in this situation, we often refer to S of rho A as the entanglement entropy. This, uh, this language is really only makes sense if the, it, calling it an entanglement entropy really only makes sense if the, if the state on the full space is pure. Because in that case, S of rho A is really measuring the entanglement of that full state uh, between A and B. Um, and I suppose I should have mentioned that S of a pure state is zero. So if you start with a pure state and you trace out part of it, um, then you can get a mixed state in a subregion. And uh, the, the von Neumann entropy of that mixed state is measuring the amount of entanglement between A and B. Uh, actually, we often just call it the entanglement entropy. We often just call the quantum entropy the entanglement entropy in all situations. It's not really necessarily a measure of entanglement, um, but we, we call it that. You can think of it always as the entanglement of, um, of, a, of a system with, the, with its purifier. So to purify a quantum state, um, I saw someone ask in the chat, to purify a quantum state means um, if you have a mixed state, you introduce an auxiliary system and uh, define a state in the combined system, which is pure, uh, which reduces to your desired mixed state uh, in a subspace. Um, okay, so the quantum entropy should be contrasted from the coarse-grained entropy, uh, 
So, uh, Tom, there's a question. Yes. Uh, the, does the number of states required to purify include the state itself? Because for pure state, this number is one, so that entropy is zero. No, no auxiliary states are required to pure. The answer is no. Um, if, a, if a state is pure, then you don't require any auxiliary states to purify it. But what it's counting is the number of, um, I guess I should say here, here it's, it's the number of auxiliary states, the number of extra states that you need to add to purify your system. So, so the coarse grain. Sorry, just sorry. Uh, one more question. A tensor product of Hilbert space, you mean states can be factorized or that the states are linear combination of factorized states? Um, I only mean that it, I only mean that the Hilbert space factorizes the, the um, if, if a state factorizes, then it's called separable and there is no entanglement. Um, and what the entanglement entropy measures is the ability to, um, well, the entanglement entropy measures the violation of that, the violation of separability. So these formulas, the, the, the entanglement entropy uh, measures entanglement in states which are sums of, they're, they're sums of, of factors in the, sums of pieces in the two factors. The coarse grained entropy, uh, well, when we, when we learn thermodynamics, that's the coarse grained entropy as opposed to the quantum entropy. So coarse, different coarse grainings can be considered, uh, but uh, for example, the thermal entropy that we talk about in ordinary thermodynamics um, is a coarse grained entropy, which is coarse grained um, where you keep track. So in, in, by coarse graining, I mean, we keep track of some macroscopic observables like the energy, maybe the charge, um, and coarse grain over everything else. So the thermal entropy in the canonical ensemble, um, or microcanonical ensemble rather, is um, S thermal of E for some as a function of energy E is defined to be uh, the maximum over rho of the quantum entropy S of rho where the maximum is taken over states which have the correct coarse grained observables. So um, in this case, it's the max over rho such that um, trace of rho times the Hamiltonian is equal to E. So this is the states that we maximize over. And uh, one way of understanding the, the Boltzmann distribution um, is that this is maximized, this entropy is maximized uh, at fixed energy uh, for the thermal state rho beta equals e to the minus beta e. Uh, for the temperature, with the temperature beta um, chosen to, to give expectation, to be, give energy expectation equal to e. Okay, so that's just one way of thinking about the thermal state. Um, and that's how it would relate to the quantum entropy. So in particular, the coarse grain entropy is always larger than any fine grained entropy with the same, with the same macroscopic observables because it's defined by this maximizing procedure. And I'm emphasizing this because eventually we're gonna be talking about entropy of, of things like black holes and radiation. And it's important to keep in mind that um, the ordinary laws of, of thermodynamics apply to thermodynamic quantities like the, like the thermodynamic entropy. Um, so for example, uh, this thermal entropy S of E obeys the second law. That is, it increases uh, under time evolution. Whereas the quantum entropy, the fine-grained entropy S of rho uh, is constant. under unitary evolution, which is something uh, that follows easily from the definition of the von Neumann entropy. Okay, um, so what we're gonna do now is gonna work through some, we're gonna work through two applications that combine these two concepts, Euclidean path integrals and 
entanglement. I don't think I covered anything um, too difficult in this entanglement part, but let me pause here and take any quick questions about the, the introduction to, to entropy. Are there any questions? Uh... Okay, I guess not. I think, I think, um, oh, is there one? Uh, I guess, yeah. Could you explain the quantum entropy once again and why it is constant under initial division? I think that's a question. Okay, the quantum entropy is, is this. Um, and the, the way to think about it is that um, there are two notions of entropy. There's fine-grained entropy and coarse-grained entropy. Fine-grained entropy uh, is the entropy when you know everything about the quantum state. Okay, so in this case, we have the exact density matrix of a quantum state, and there's still an entropy associated to that density matrix um, if it's mixed, if it's a if it's a mixed density matrix, even if we know it exactly, there's an entropy associated to it. Um, whereas the coarse grained entropy is more like um, what we think about in in thermodynamics, where like okay, if we know, say the entropy of the of the air in this room, um, there's entropy um, even if even if the room is in a pure state. If I were completely isolated from the universe and I was in a pure state. Uh, I could still meaningfully talk about the the thermodynamic entropy of the gas in this room, and it would obey the law of thermodynamic the laws of thermodynamics. Um, I guess the other part of the question is is why the quantum entropy is constant, and um, so that so for that let's just do the time evolution. So under time evolution, um, the density matrix evolves according to um, u rho u dagger, where u is the time evolution operator e to the minus iht. And um, we could just plug that into the definition and it's invariant. It's slightly annoying to see that because of the log but uh, a, a, a nice trick to think about it is think about powers, trace of, think about powers, trace row to the n. This is clearly invariant under, uh, under time evolution because all the u's and u daggers will just cancel out. Um, and a log is like a, a log is like a derivative of this with respect to n, so it's also invariant. Is there another question? Yeah, so the next question was, what is the difference between pure states and separable states? Um, well, a, a separable state just means that, that rho a b is rho a times tensor product rho b. And now that, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's pure. That could be a mixed state times a mixed state. It just means that there's no correlation um, between the two. So that's a separable state. A pure state is one for which um, rho is equal to psi psi for some psi. Uh, so the next question is, does S-thermal define uh, in this way match with the semi-classical thermal entropy when the system size is large? Yes, it does. Yes. Um, that's the statement. That's because, and I haven't proved this, but that follows from this fact here, that the um, that one way of defining the ordinary thermodynamic um, density matrix, um, the Boltzmann distribution, is, is to maximize entropy uh, subject to a constraint on the energy. Uh, okay, so the next question is, how is the entropy of a pure state zero since the number of extra states required to purify it is itself zero? Uh, 
Um, I it's it's about the oh, I see. I see. Um, um, you worried about the log. Wait, let me think about that. Um, Okay, the, let me let me just say let me just say I don't want to get stuck on this. So let me just say that the, this is really only useful for large. This is useful when things are large. There is an exact statement when when things are small, but um, I only want to think about this when when s is large. Um, so let's let's not worry about it. Okay. Uh, so next question is: Does the state which gives the coarse grain entropy? Coincide with the state after coarse graining, uh, like in real space renormalization. Um, well, it's uh, with this def yes, with this definition of coarse grain. So, if coarse graining means but th that's just the definition of coarse graining, though. Uh, this is not the same coarse graining that we do in in the real space renormalization group. This is a different coarse graining, where we um, fix the energy and then pick the most likely state with that energy, essentially. Uh, so under that coarse graining, the uh, the answer is yes. Okay, so let me go on to the first application. Uh, which is to the unru radiation and the thermo field double, which I will define. Okay, so uh, what I want to do is combine these things that we've discussed, the path integral uh, approach and uh, entanglement and discuss um, discuss um, how they come together in quantum field theory. Okay, so um, uh, recall that we discussed a few minutes ago that the vacuum state is prepared by the path integral on a half space. Uh, sorry, okay, so just one. Uh, I don't mind. Uh, like it is, the question is, where does beta enter the definition of cold grain entropy? Um, it doesn't. So the um, the the beta that appears here. Is a function of energy. It's the trans. So there's a translation. There's a translation between beta and e that comes from uh, microcanonical versus canonical ensemble. And so you should think of the, the that beta as being um, chosen to get the desired energy. It's really a function of energy. Okay, so the path integral uh, that defines the uh, vacuum state, remember is this one where the spatial slices go this way and uh, Euclidean time goes this way and uh, we've evolved over a, a semi-infinite Euclidean time to project onto the vacuum state. What I wanna do is to re interpret um, this path integral in a different way. So uh, when we interpreted it before, uh, I thought of it as e to the minus tau h um, acting on um, anything. And um, so what I mean by that is we impose some regularity condition down here, and then we slice the path integral or we think of the time direction as going this way so that these are the spatial slices and that, and then we use the basic definition or the basic uh, key property 
fundamental property of the Euclidean path integral to translate between this operator picture and the path integral picture. What I wanna do now is to reinterpret exactly the same path integral, but with a different slicing. So instead of slicing uh, that way, I'm now gonna do the slices radially, like in polar coordinates. Okay, same path integral. Uh, I'm just thinking now of these things as being the spatial slices and uh, time going around. Now, um, this, is, this is no longer looks like a path integral that defines a quantum state, because if I put, if I call this region A over here and region B over there, then it looks like this path integral has, has, has two cuts. It has a cut at, at early time. It has, it has a cut at, at, at A. Then we evolve it by some angular evolution. And then there's a cut at B. So uh, what this looks like is an operator, call it V, um, from the Hilbert space in region A to the Hilbert space in region B. What operator is it? Uh, well, it's simply the operator that corresponds to angular evolution. And we're evolving the angle by an amount pi. Uh, so the operator is e to the um, pi k, where k is the um, Euclidean rotation. It's the Hamiltonian that corresponds not to evolution in, in time, but to evolution in angle, which is the Euclidean rotation. Uh, but Euclidean rotation uh, is what we usually call boost. Okay, so K here is the boost charge. If we, uh, so, um, what we've done is we've taken this path integral and reinterpreted it as, as this operator e to the minus pi k. If I insert a, a, a set of states n, I can write, a, write this operator um, as e to the minus pi k on this complete set of states. Um, with the caveat that one of these, this, this is really a transit, this is really mapping the Hilbert space A to the Hilbert space B. Um, so um, one of these is on A and the other one is on B. Okay. Now, in this case, uh, there's a, um, well, these Hilbert spaces are not really different from each other. They're just, so this is, it, it, as we're coming to A is essentially Rindler space. It's it's half it's half of space. So this is going to be like Rindler space, um, and the the right half line A and the left half line B uh, they have the same Hilbert space. Okay, they're they're isomorphic to each other, um, with uh, one subtlety, which is that um, there's a conjugation involved in in going from the right to the left, which is a, a, like a CPT or a, a charged time reflection conjugation. I'm gonna um, write formulas that are true, but I don't really wanna go into the subtlety of how that conjugation works. It's just because there's an orientation difference um, in the, on the two sides. So the upshot is that we can reinterpret Um, this path integral as a state in two copies of the Hilbert space A by acting with this conjugation. Because now, um, well, let me write the formula. The original path integral is the Minkowski vacuum. And we've shown that this is the same as the sum over n e to minus pi 
Kn uh, of n bar, which is a, is this CRT conjugate in one copy of A and in the other copy of A. This is the this is a key result, which says that in words the Minkowski vacuum. Uh, is equal to um, a pure state, which is called the thermal field double state. And the reason for calling the thermal field double will become clear in a minute. And this thermal field double state is uh, defined in two copies of Rindler space, the left and right halves of Minkowski. Let me draw the Lorentzian picture and then I'll pause for questions. So the interpretation in Lorentzian signature is the following. So this is a picture of um, of Minkowski space, R d minus one comma one. And um, what we've done is we've cut space, we've cut the space at time zero into two parts, B and A. Um, and we can either think of the Minkowski vacuum as living on all of Minkowski space a space of, at time zero uh, or we can think of it as this uh, state the thermal field double state on uh, the union of the regions b and a and um, well if you work a bit harder and i'm not going to show this part but if you work a bit harder well, we can we can almost see it from this expression. Let, let me explain it first, and then I'll see how we can we can basically see it from this expression. Um, so, um, the question I want to answer now is, what is the physics of this state? And the answer is that uh, it's an entangled state between the two sides of Minkowski space. So, uh, there are modes over here in region A which point to the left, and those are entangled with some similar modes in region B. So these are entangled. And similarly, uh, there are modes which are pointing to the right, um, and those are entangled. And uh, if we, if we want to draw a few more of these, there are, there are more modes out here um, in region B, which are entangled with modes over here uh, in region A, and similarly for the right moving modes. Now, um, where do we get this picture? So let's let's just let's just compare here. Okay, so um, this is a this is an entangled state, which is the sum of uh, correlated states between left and right. Um, so that's how we're getting entanglement between similar states on the left and right. Now, um, let's ask how how let's ask about the weighting. Okay, so there's this there's this Boltzmann-like factor here, um, which says that states are suppressed by their boost charge in this sum. That is, um, if a state has a large boost charge, then uh, it's highly suppressed here. Well, the states with a large boost charge are the ones out, are the ones far away uh, from the origin. If you have states that are very close to this bifurcation surface here in the middle of Minkowski space, those are states with vanishingly small, as, as you take them all the way to the middle, the boost charge goes to zero. Okay, so uh, the conclusion is that the Rindler modes in, uh, that are very close to the origin here are um, 
essentially in a maximally mixed state, whereas the Rindler modes uh, out here are uh, are suppressed. They're in a they're in a entangled state, but it's very suppressed in the sum. Um, good. So let me pause here for questions. So one question is if uh, if the if these two uh, ends are in different Hilbert spaces, how is the summation over n defined? Uh, well, what I've used here is um, the fact that these are not they're they're in different Hilbert spaces, but they're isomorphic to each other. Okay, because when we started here, um, what I did so this is space. I just cut space in half. And um, I, I call the right half A and the left half B, but these are both half spaces. Okay, so the Hilbert space on A, uh, there's a natural isomorphism from the Hilbert space on A to the Hilbert space on B. And uh, I'm using that isomorphism here um, to just think of everything as, as being a state on, 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 on half space. So, um, I'm thinking of the full space as as two entangled copies of the half of of the half space, which have the same Hilbert space as each other. Okay. So the next question is: uh, so both the the states appearing here are kids. Uh, shouldn't one of them be Um Well, that's just a convention, really. I mean, the the path integral that we originally defined. If we think of it as being a transition amplitude, then this path integral has one bra and one cat. Um, but I can think about it this way. The only difference is that when I calculate a matrix, so all these pictures, of course, are, are just prescriptions for calculating matrix elements. And um, the, the only difference when I write it this way is that when I when I give it some field data on region B, so when I give it the field data that gives the boundary condition on region B, I give it conjugate data. Okay, so um, the matrix elements defined from this thing where I put conjugate data here will be the same as the matrix elements defined by this thing uh, with the, the, same, the same boundary conditions up to a conjugation. I've just taken the complex conjugate of the stuff on the left. Uh, so the next question is, what's the difference between this Euclidean rotation and Lorentz boosts? Um, so Lorentz, the, well, there, there isn't really a difference. The only difference is an I. Okay, so the, the, the vector field that uh, the vector field corresponding to a Lorentz boost is up to an I, the, the same as the Euclidean rotation. Uh, let me write, a, let me write a, a formula. So the vector field that generates Euclidean rotations is um, tau dy minus y d tau. And the vector field that generates Lorentz boosts is um, T dy plus y dt, and those just differ by tau to it. So the next question is, is there any subtlety about the boundary condition at the origin of rotation? Yes, there, there is. Um, well, I should, I, should, I should make the caveat that um, all these expressions are somewhat, are, are formal expressions uh, because um, of UV divergences. Okay, so in this sum, um, we have to include modes that are very close to the origin. And those modes, so and those modes are not suppressed in the sum. The closer you get to the origin, the lower the boost charge. There's no suppression there. Okay, so those modes give give divergent contributions to these expressions. And uh, when we calculate something like uh, like an entanglement entropy, as as we're coming to, 
um, we have to regulate somehow uh, by, for example, um, cutting out a little, a little dot at the origin, regulating and keeping track of those UV divergences. The entanglement entropy in a something like a qubit, like a qubit model, uh, or a, a spin chain in condensed matter, is a finite quantity. But the entanglement entropy in quantum field theory has these UV divergences coming from exactly those subtleties when you try to, uh, to do this division. Another way of saying it is that um, if, we, if we go back, well, another way of saying it is that I've been a little bit uh, quick here and I pretended that we could separate the Hilbert space of quantum field theory into, um, into two pieces associated to the, to the left and right Rindler wedge. That's actually not quite true in quantum field theory because of these UV divergences. Uh, you can't really separate the Hilbert space of quantum field theory uh, at a point like this. Um, however, um, if you, you can, in almost all situations, maybe all situations that I know of, you can pretend, uh, well, not quite all of them. In most situations, you can pretend that, that you can separate the Hilbert space of quantum field theory in this way. Um, for these formal manipulations, when you go to do a calculation, it'll lead to divergences. And then you have to regulate the divergences to make sense of your expressions and make sure that the things that you're talking about are not uh, sensitive to those divergent terms. Other questions? So the next question is, can you draw the states that get n in the Lorentzian picture? Um, yeah, that's that's really what I was doing here. So so let me give a let me give a, a formula. Um, okay, I'm not going to derive this, but um, this, okay, so this formula here um, is true in any quantum field theory. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to write down, I'm going to write this down in the more, uh, in the language of, of A's and A daggers that we talk about in, in free quantum field theory. Okay, so if you take this expression and you write it down for a, a free quantum field, um, then what it says is that zero, the Minkowski vacuum, um, up to some factors that I won't keep track of, is the exponential of minus sum over k, um, a dagger b k, a dagger r k, acting on um, the Rindler vacuum. Two, two copies of the Rindler vacuum. Um, and this K here is the Rindler momentum. Or, well, there's a, there's a, there's an additional factor of omega K. That I forgot here. Okay, so K is the Rindler momentum. Omega K is the is the um, boost charge, and so what this so th this is just a rewriting of of the expression above uh, for the case of 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 a free boson, um, and it's telling you that in term in the in the language of the Rindler modes, you're creating a a a, a state which has entangled correlated pairs of uh, Rindler modes on the left with Rindler modes on the right. And those are exactly the modes that I was drawing uh, in this picture here. So uh, this, this A dagger appears with this A dagger and similarly for the other ones that are the same color. So the next question, should I think of entangled states say over half regions, even in general interacting theories as prepared using a path integral over an auxiliary Euclidean direction? 
In other words, is this construction gender? Yes, it is. Um, so um, this construction is general. So, well, sorry. The, the only thing the only thing that's not general is, is this equation, which has A's and A daggers in it, and therefore refer, refers to the um, oscillators of a free field. Everything else that I've described is general and it applies to interacting is applies to interacting field theory. Well, I'm not claiming it's completely general. Um, there could be there could be situations where um, there are difficulties with with um, boundary conditions. There could be gravitational anomalies that we have to worry about subtleties like that. But it's essentially general. It it applies to interacting theories um, that we can prepare the vacuum state by this Euclidean path integral and um, the statement that the Minkowski vacuum is the thermal field double is true in interacting field theory. More questions? So next question is, uh, what if the boost charge is large? Should it be a maximal entangled state with large dimension n or if the weight is not normalized? Well, the normalization is something you do at the end after doing the sum. Um, so if the boost charge is large, then that, that will essentially get, there would just be a very small number in front of it when you do the normalization. So, the, the, so those states are, are, they appear, but they're highly suppressed as you'd expect um, in a thermal ensemble. The next question, it seems that the K is evolving the A slice down while the B slice up in time direction. How should we interpret K as a Hamiltonian? Isn't that necessary to call the global vacuum a uh, uh, thermal field double? I'm not sure I understood the question, but um, it's true that, that K generates this time evolution. Okay, so it, it, if we evolve in, in, in K, well, yeah, boosts go, uh, a, a given boost uh, will boost up on the right and, and down on the left. Um, so it generates the evolution from this slice to this slice uh, to this slice, but that's not a problem. We can talk about the charge that generates that, um, that generates that motion. So I, I don't think there's any problem with calling this a thermal field double. I'll, I'll come in a minute to why it's the thermal field double, which is trace, but the, the short reason is that when we trace over, um, over one half, we get a thermal state in the other half. Uh, the next question is, why is the vacuum state different? If I do this to an arbitrary state, what will be the difference? Well, I, what's, yeah. Um, well, I, I think um, maybe the, Maybe the question is really what, why is the vacuum state special? Okay, so the vacuum state is special uh, in various ways. One is, the, one is because we can, have, we can prepare it by Euclidean path integral. Okay, that's, that's special. Um, but um, maybe a more physical way of, of saying it is that the, the vacuum, well, as we've shown, the vacuum is highly correlated at short distances. Okay, that's an essential feature of quantum fields, that they have a, a highly entangled, highly correlated vacuum as, as, as you go to short distance. Um, and um, that's what we're seeing here. I, I, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but that I think... I think that's as close as I can get to answering that question. Okay, uh, so the next question is how to identify states in A and B a priori. Sorry, what was the last word? A priori, how to identify states in A and B. Well, these states are, you could, remember we can think about these states as, as being a basis that we can think about them in the field basis. Okay, so what is the state? Um, we can we can put it in the in the well. This is not not quite true because the field basis is not renormalizable. 
um, but as long as we smear it out a bit, um, we can think about this in the field basis. Okay, so if, if, if region A is a half space, then the set of states is, is roughly corresponds to the, to the field data you can put on a half space. Now, region B is also a half space. So the, the states in region B correspond to fields you can put on a half space. They differ by an orientation, which is where some of these bars come from. But otherwise, it's it's just the same. It's the same states. the The states are, uh, you know, this the states. The Hilbert space of a quantum field theory, as I emphasized earlier, is determined by space, not by space time. It's a, you have a, a Hilbert space associated to the space. In this case, space is uh, half of R d minus one for both A and B. So they have the same Hilbert space uh, or yeah, they have the same Hilbert space up to this, this uh, reorientation. Uh, the next question is any references for more information about thermophile double? Um, let me, Post a bunch of references on the on the Slack channel, or I'll I'll, I'll put them into uh, one of the slides in in my next lecture. Um, there are lecture notes on my website. There are good lectures by Daniel Harlow um, on the archive, um, and there's a paper by Maldacena called um, "Eternal Black Holes and Anti De Sitter," which discusses the thermofield double. Uh, those are the ones that come to mind. And, uh, the last question. Uh, so, in the reinterpreting section, uh, are we performing a coordinate change from Minkowski to Rindler in the path integral? I wouldn't think about it that way. Um, I, you can think about yeah, you can think about it that way. Um, but these pictures are really the the path integral is is coordinate invariant, and these pictures are coordinate invariant. Um, the way I would think about it is that um, there's this translation between the operator formalism and the path integral formalism. And what we've done is we've taken this operator expression, translated it into a Euclidean path integral, then reinterpreted that Euclidean path integral uh, as a different operator expression. So we've just we've turned it into a path integral, and then we've gone back to operator language uh, with a different notion of 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 the time slicing. Um, because when we take that Euclidean path integral, all directions are equivalent. We can do the time slicing however we want, and the formalism, the fundamental properties of the Euclidean path integral still apply. Um, so I just have one more um, thing to say about the theorem field double which is uh, well, why, it's, why it has that name. Um, and the reason is that when we trace out one of these regions, as you probably anticipated, we get a thermal state. Okay, so uh, A, let's call A, so A is Rindler, is Rindler space. So let me rename it right now as Rindler. Uh, if we trace out B, then rho Rindler is, um, so this is the trace over B of the um, ground state density matrix, the, the um, ground state of the Minkowski ground state. And um, we've given here this, so if you, if you take this expression um, for the, um, take this expression for the, the ground state, and just do the trace over one of these, uh, over one copy, the two copies, just, just do the partial trace. Um, then I'm not gonna work through the algebra, but this is a straightforward exercise. Uh, then what you'll find is uh, sum over N. Well, I am not sure about the proportionality factor. So let me write squiggle. Uh, sum over n of uh, e to the minus two pi k n of n a n 
A. And so that uh, we now recognize uh, as a thermal state because this is just the insertion of the identity. So the conclusion is that Rho Rindler is uh, up to normalization, the operator e to the minus two pi k. Uh, in words, uh, Rindler is thermal. Well, the density matrix in Rindler space is a thermal state, but it's a thermal state with respect to this funny Hamiltonian, the boost charge, the boost Hamiltonian, or boost energy. Um, since that's the one that generates the time evolution in Rindler space, so this rotation that we derived it from. Okay, so this is a derivation now of the Unruh effect. The Unruh effect is the, the statement that, um, well, it's, it's essentially this formula. Um, as a, often it's stated as saying that uniformly accelerated observers will detect a temperature. Uh, note that I've derived this without any, without any reference uh, to an observer. Um, and um, uh, sorry, I should, I should have mentioned that this is at inverse temperature beta equals two pi. Uh, and you can easily recover from this expression uh, the statement that accelerated observers detect a temperature, uh, which is uh, an inverse temperature two pi times a factor that depends on the acceleration. The reason for that is is just that um, this is thermal with respect to the boost the boost charge, and accelerated observers have a proper time that's conjugate to boost charge. So uniformly accelerated observers, uh, they measure an energy that's, that's uh, conjugate to their proper time. And that will just be the, the boost energy. So that's why they, they'll detect the thermal state up to, up to some normalization factors, uh, which is where the acceleration comes in. Okay, so let me um, pause here again, see if there are any quick questions before we go on uh, and start the next application. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any questions. Okay, so I'll, I'll just start the next one um, and we'll finish it next time. So the other application that I wanted to discuss is um, the entanglement entropy in 2D CFT. Okay, so in two-dimensional CFT, and this is following uh, a method of Cardian calibration. So the entanglement entropy, uh, well, let me pose the question. So the question is the following. Um, let's take a CFT whose space is just the real line. It's, it's 2D CFT, so space is one-dimensional. So space is the real line. Uh, and then we take a, a, a region on the real line, uh, call that region A. And let's assume that the state of the CFT on the full line is the vacuum state. And uh, what we'd like to do is to find the entanglement entropy S of rho A. The full state is pure, of course. So the full, the full von Neumann entropy of, of the pure state is zero. Um, but uh, when we hide, so think of this as, as splitting space into two, into two regions, the inside of A and the outside of A. Uh, and then we hide everything in the outside of A. So we just have access to region A. And the question is, what is the entanglement entropy or what is the quantum entropy of that subregion? 
we're going to do this calculation using the replica method. So in the replica method, uh, remember we're trying to calculate S of rho, which is minus trace of, I'm gonna write this a little bit differently than I did before. Uh, I'm gonna write this with rho, with hats. Okay, so the, the, re, the meaning of the hat is that the hat is a normalized state. Okay, so rho hat is uh, rho over trace rho. When I gave you the definition of the von Neumann entropy earlier, I was assuming that the state was normalized. But as we've discussed, the, the states you get out of a path integral are unnormalized. So it's convenient to, to sort of do this in two steps where we work with unnormalized, uh, unnormalized density matrices, uh, but then we have to include these extra normalization factors. Okay, so the point of the replica method is that, um, well, what we'd like to do is to calculate this entropy by a, a Euclidean path integral. But it's hard to deal with this log, okay? There is no Euclidean path integral that uh, directly, or it's, it's tricky, let's say, to write down a Euclidean path integral that calculates the log, right? This is the log of an operator. And how do we calculate the log of a path integral? Okay, so that's tricky. Uh, but the way around this is the replica method the idea is to uh, introduce the replica partition function, z of n, which is trace of rho to the n. Um, and then, um, well, first, let me give some uh, terminology. So uh, if we do this for the normalized partition, for the normalized state, rho hat, trace of rho hat to the n uh, defines what's called the Rennie entropy by the equation uh, that this is exponential of minus n minus one Sn, uh, where this thing uh, is called the Rennie entropy. The Rennie entropy uh, is similar to the von Neumann entropy, but is a different measure of, of entanglement. Um, and the nice thing about the Rennie entropy is that S of n goes to one is the von Neumann entropy S, the quantum entropy. Okay. Um, and so in terms of this replica partition function Z of n, um, you can think about this as follows, that if we expand, if we take this expression here, for z of n, and we expand n is equal to one plus epsilon with epsilon small, um, then the leading term in that, or the, the leading term in that expansion um, is gonna be a row log row term, because when we expand out that n, we'll get a low, row log row. Um, and therefore, you can use that expansion to read off the von Neumann entropy. And when you work through the normalization factors, which is a quick little exercise, uh, you find that S of rho is minus dn of z of n over z of 1 to the n uh, evaluated at n equals 1. So we're just taking the Taylor expansion of that, um, of that expression. Um, and so this is what we're going to use to calculate the von Neumann entropy from the path integral. We're going to write down a path integral that calculates the replica partition function z of n and expand it in as the replica. Then we're going to formally analytically continue. So the path integral we can do is one where n is an integer. That's the, that's the one that's completely clear how to set it up. But we're going to find a way to analytically continue that path integral away from integer n and do that calculation near n equals one. So we'll start with that calculation tomorrow. Um, let me pause and if I can take a couple more minutes, I can take a, a couple more questions. Uh, I'll also go on the, on the Slack too though. 
So uh, there's a question, uh, why does a replica trick work? In other words, how do you choose the analytic continuation away from the integers? It's ambiguous. I'm aware of Carlson's theorem, but why should we satisfy the requirement of the theorem? Um, that's a good question. And the answer is that I don't think we, I don't think we have a general answer to that question. There are examples like free fields where you can, where you can show that the assumptions of Carlson's theorem should apply. Um, but I'm not aware of a general argument. Um, the way I usually think about it, and this isn't totally satisfactory, but the way I usually think about it is that we, we will just try a natural analytic continuation. Um, and if it gives us reasonable answers that obey the axioms of entropy, um, then I'll trust those answers in quantum field theory. But I think this is important to understand better. So the next query is, I didn't understand how the log term comes out of rho, rho to the power n. I've just used the Taylor expansion, rho to the one plus epsilon is um, whatever it is, rho um, plus epsilon, rho log rho. Is that what it is? I, okay, I, I don't know if I got the signs right and everything, but it's just that Taylor expansion. Okay, uh, so uh, sorry about asking the delay, but how to understand from the maximized interpretation of thermal entropy that the entanglement entropy with spherical entangling surface can be transformed to thermal entropy of hyperbolic space in a CFT? Um. I don't know. I don't know of a direct connection between those two facts. So those are both true that, that coarse grain entropy is defined by this procedure, um, and that um, the entanglement entropy of a ball in, in a conformal field theory can be interpreted as a thermal entropy in hyperbolic space. Um, I, it's, I think it's just the fact that the reduced density matrix in hyperbolic space, uh, for reasons coming from conformal symmetry, turns out to be the the entropy maximizing state. Uh, but I don't know of any simple way of, of, of seeing that without, without thinking about doing the conformal transformations and, and uh, applying the usual steps. So uh, the next question is, can we always consider thermal entropy of a system as an entanglement entropy of the thermophile double? If so, how can thermal entropy increase with time since entanglement entropy is constant with time? This is true only in equilibrium. So in, in thermal equilibrium, that is in the, like if you're really in the state, e to the minus beta h, um, then you can think of the, uh, that thermal entropy as, as coming from entanglement with an auxiliary system. Um, but it's, yeah, you, you, you can't use that to, like I, I, as you as you point out, you you can't use that to conclude that the that the thermal entropy is constant in time. Uh, so next question: In the beginning, you said we will consider QFT in curved space time, but not coupled to gravity. Does that mean we are considering sphere type space times? Um, every so so let's see. Let me think about the different things that I've said. When I discussed the Unruh effect, that was in Minkowski space. Okay, so that, that was not curved space. Uh, everything else that I said um, about path integrals preparing the vacuum state, well, about path integrals in general, that was all true in curved space. The part about the uh, vacuum state, as I said in response to an earlier question, um, that you could do that in curved space, then the, the path integral would be on a, a SD minus one times times time. Um, you can, if you want to do a path integral um, of a CFTD 
on SD, um, then you can. Okay, so um, well with CFT, C CFT is a little CFT is special. Okay, CFT is special because you can map the you can map the sphere uh, to the plane, and in fact, if you if you Good. Okay. So it, it, let me go back a step. If you do QFT on a sphere, um, then the basic facts that I described are still true. That, that you can think of um, the path integral of a QFT on a half sphere as preparing some state. And then you can think of the full sphere as being the overlap of the overlap psi psi. What's special about conformal field theory uh, is that, um, well, with this essentially maps to radial quantization. Okay, so in, in conformal field theory, we define this path integral on the half sphere as, um, well, we interpret this path integral as defining the vacuum state in radial quantization because there's a, because there's a conserved charge, the dilatation operator uh, that is the time evolution on the half sphere. So this is just another reslicing of that path integral, similar to the reslicings that we did in the discussion of the Unruh effect, but now it's a reslicing where the Hamiltonian is dilatations instead of boosts. I don't know if there's another, I don't, I, I, I didn't, I don't know what the schedule is. I don't want to go into the the next one if we're if we're supposed to stop but i'm happy to keep going if we have if we have time uh, we don't have anything uh, right now i think the next uh, talk is like one tomorrow morning but okay ah uh, okay okay yeah right. so uh, okay uh, so yeah continuation of this previous question about this uh, sphere like space time uh, are we considering general metric but no gravity effects uh Again, um, for th for the discussion of path of cutting the path integrals to define a quantum state, the answer is yes. Um, you can do that on any manifold, um, but but that's right. We're not including gravitational effects in gra in gravity. Uh, as we'll come to, you can't you don't you're not allowed to specify a manifold. Of course, when you do gravity, when you when you do gravity, it's it's you sum over the manifold. Um, so we'll have to have a new prescription for doing path integrals when we talk about gravity, uh, and we're going to come to that. But everything here is everything else I said. Uh, the basics I'll work on any on any curve background, and um, I think I'll talk more about this next time. But uh, this derivation I gave of the Unruh effect is essentially unchanged to be and becomes the derivation of Hawking radiation. You have to change it a little bit to allow for the fact that it's a black hole background. But Hawking radiation is really derived using this same idea, um, but with the quantum fields on a black hole background. Uh, just like in thermodynamics, is there any free energy associated with entanglement entropy also? Yeah, there is. There is. The, um, and it's very a very useful one. So the the analog of free energy. Um, well, let me make sure I'm going to say this right. Um, the analog of free energy is um, is relative entropy. So so relative entropy. Um, The, the reason I say that is so the, the relative entropy of two states um, has the interp has a it's it's the it's the quantum analog of the um, of the difference in free energy up to a factor of beta and I'd have to think about the sign to get it right but uh, this is the analog. And uh, so next question, what would the higher order terms in the Rennie entropy mean? In other words, for other values of n, what do these SN correspond to? Uh, is this even a valid question to ask? 
Um, it's certainly a valid question. I don't have a, I don't, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, it's a measure that you can think of them as measures of, as, as measuring entanglement, similar to what you do for the entanglement entropy. Um, but they don't have all the same that entanglement entropy has. Um, some of the some of the inequalities that it obeys and and the properties that it has under um, doing various operations on the density matrix, those aren't all. Uh, many of those are much nicer for the von Neumann entropy, and that's why we like to usually talk about the von Neumann entropy instead of the Rennie entropies. But if all you want to do is measure the entanglement, then um, I think you're you're free to use the the Rennie entropy, you get a different answer. It's a different me it's a, it's a different measure of, of entanglement, but it has a, a similar sort of qualitative interpretation. Okay, I don't uh, see any further questions. Uh, okay, okay, just one minute. Um, I thought Euclidean rotations are boosts um, when you. Uh, when considered in Minkowski space, that's what your definition seems to suggest as well. You however compare the rotations and the boosts in the slim plane, which I earlier thought was a Lorentzian Minkowski space. Uh, I see the connection you do, and it makes sense. Can you clarify whether my assumption was wrong? I I don't know if I followed that. Maybe I'll try. I'll bring up the chat and see if I can yeah. read it. Yeah. Uh, actually, I don't see it. Uh, oh, I see it. Okay. Um, Okay, I don't, I'm not sure I understand the question, but let me try to answer it anyway, and we can follow up in Slack. Um, so, and, and maybe this picture is useful to draw anyway. Um, I like to think about the, the Euclidean manifold as sort of coming out of the page. Okay, so, so this is Minkowski. The, what I've drawn here are the Minkowski light cones. Uh, but we can draw the Euclidean manifold as being perpendicular. Okay, sorry, my drawing is not great, but um, that's supposed to go into the page. That's supposed to go into the page, um, and they meet on this. Um, they intersect on this slice here. So why do they intersect there? Well, just because tau is it. Right, so um, if the Euclidean time is the the slice when when that's zero, they're the same. Okay, so uh, the the Euclidean manifold at Euclidean time zero is the same as the Lorentzian manifold at Lorentzian time zero. So I think of these as intersecting here, and the um, the boost. Um, well, now now my picture is really going to get confusing, but. Um, the, the boost acts in the Minkowski piece of it as, as the boost, and it acts in the, in the uh, Euclidean piece of it as the rotation. It's the, it's the same vector field just being analytically continued to a different piece of this uh, manifold that has both Euclidean pieces and Lorentzian pieces. Uh, okay, then there's a... Question, why shouldn't we use this method to discuss the entropy of radiation from the usual two energy level atoms? In that case, we have alternate method, alternative method to get the result through direct quantum mechanical calculation. I'm not sure what's meant by this method. We, what uh, method are we talking about? Replica method, I suppose, uh, I'm assuming. Uh, well, we're free to use the replica method in, um, let's say a, a qubit or a condensed matter or whatever, we can always use the replica method. Uh, what's special about quantum field theory is gonna be the fact that, um, is that replicas have a nice path integral calculation. So that's something that's special about, about relativistic quantum fields uh, that we can write these path integral expressions uh, for, the, for the density matrix and for its replica partition function and it's something special about conformal field theory that we can actually evaluate those path integrals. 
or free theory, free field theory. So next question, does the relative entropy have anything to do with Casimir energy? Because in the case of Casimir force, also we are separating the total region by two parallel plates. Um, I would say, the, I don't know, I don't know the specific relationship, but um, I wouldn't be surprised at all if there was a relationship between the relative entropy and the, and the Casimir, and the Casimir force. I, I'm not, I don't, I don't know the specific one though, probably. Okay, so I don't see any further questions. Uh, I guess we and we had a lot of questions, and I mean we can continue in Slack if you want. But, uh, uh, so so let's thank uh, Tom uh, for this uh, excellent lecture and for being very patiently answering all these questions. And um, uh, yeah, so 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 thanks. Uh, okay. Yeah. See you later, everyone. Yeah, see you later. And and, and the next uh, lecture is nine o'clock tomorrow morning, Indian Standard Time. Uh, by one. Uh, yeah. See you guys. Bye. Thanks. Guys.